Ladies and Gentlemen, herzlich willkommen im Bewohnerfrei-Podcast. So schön, euch wieder zu hören und zu sehen. Und ich habe einen ganz besonderen Gast heute. I just said I have a very special guest in our podcast and it's going to be an English version by the world famous John Strilecki. The best-selling author is not enough. He, he sells books every 10 seconds in uh, the German-speaking uh, countries. And John, are you there? There, oh, sorry. sorry, Toby. Are we starting already? I, I was yes, just, I, I just, oh, oh, you, I was doing a little reading, <laughs> uh, just a little catching up on some good self development reading here. So, sorry, sorry, I'm a little late to the call. That's okay. I just made an introduction that uh, about you, and actually, this is our second podcast, right? It is, yeah, yeah. We had such a good time the first time, we thought we would do it again, yeah. And it's a privilege having you here. And after we did our podcast interview, we were uh, having a dinner in Frankfurt. Do you remember that? I, that was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you what, for anybody who's listening, uh, if you want to go hang out at good restaurants, you got to hang out with Toby because <laughs> I am not wired that way. So I'd be like, yeah, whatever. It's like right down the street. We'll go. But Toby was like, no, no, no. I know the place we need to go to. And I have to say, even for someone like me, where food is not a super high priority, that was a spectacular meal. So you picked an amazing spot. And remember what happened when I wanted to pay the bill? It was already paid by one of our clients who was so excited. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. 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 Great so, place. Um, John, I will, I will skip the proper introdu introduction. I will do that after we talked. And uh, I mean, it's impossible not knowing you if you just put, put your little toe in the personal development swimming pool. People will have heard about you. You're the author of Big Five for Life, of uh, in German, Café am Rande der Welt, Café at the, at the End of the World. And uh, now you wrote a book about what you have learned on the way. And actually, the subline is even more important. Um, in German, it's, uh, what, what, it's pretty much what makes people happy. What is, what is it all about, right? Yeah, so in English, it's uh, reflections on living a fulfilled life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, especially today, I think we should frame it because we are talking right now at a moment where the whole world has something that has never happened before in our lifetime and many people are getting depressed people are losing people people are losing their jobs we are here in europe now with our second lockdown yeah. i think the topic that you are playing with all your books is now more important than ever so thank you for that well, it's my pleasure and the, the genesis of this particular book with the title what i've learned uh, as i stated in the introduction i, I didn't write it And title it that because I thought the world is desperately waiting to hear what John Strzelecki has learned. I wrote it because over time I've learned and discovered that we all have this genius within us. We all have these things that we've learned, but unfortunately, very often we don't share those things with other people. My life has been shifted dramatically in positive ways, sometimes by a single concept, a single sentence that someone says to me. And funny enough, I was, I, I was, I was reading your book, Uh, because I know we're going to do some other fun stuff as well as this podcast. And you, you have little, little post-its. <laughs> and, and, but but you, you talk very early on in the book about how a single teacher shared a perspective on math and that shifted everything for you. And so I think uh, one of the big takeaways for me in writing this book was my hope is that people will reflect on, well, what have I learned in my life and who are the people that I want to share those things with, whether it's your kids or your grandkids or a good friend who's struggling Because as you said, these next months especially are perhaps going to be some of the toughest that any in our current generation have any faced. Winter is coming. People can't go outdoors as much. They're dealing with not being able to interact with their social networks like they normally do. This is an awesome time for us to be reflecting on what we have learned and giving the, that wisdom to someone who really needs it at a, at a you know, critical time. You just said winter is coming. I don't know if you're familiar familiar with the uh, net. It's a series. It's called Game of Thrones. You probably know it. And they always yeah. talk about winter is coming. It's this big yeah. thing that is coming. And before we talk about your book and personal development, it is very easy to read books. It is very easy to go on seminars. But to stay strong in a moment of struggle, in the moment when the winter is really there, not talking that it's coming, but it's right. there. That's another another topic. How do you handle that? I mean, you are you you are in the middle of that of that storm as I am. Yeah, 
Yes, and, and it hits everybody differently too. So I will give some general examples of things that have worked for me. And then it's, I think about, in hearing this, think about how do I apply this to my own life? Yes. And so one of the things that makes me me, as you know from our times interacting with each other, is I'm an adventurer. Yeah. I thrive on being out there doing adventurous things, whether that is taking a kayak down a river somewhere that I've never been in Central America or uh, surfing or something else. Traveler, so, world traveler. Yeah, exactly. And I love being in exotic destinations, not exotic, like super high end, but just different. And I love being, I hiked for the Amazon jungle. So it has been very difficult for me emotionally to be in one place for a long stretch of time. Now, now I know that somebody might hear that and be like, well, that's a high end luxury problem. And I'll be the first to admit that is, but when that's how I'm wired, it, it hurts and to not be able to do those things. And so uh, what I've tried to do is to find micro ways to fulfill my macro need in that regard. And so whether it is literally grabbing my personal kayak and just hitting a local lake that I've never been in before, just to get, okay, some of that flavor, mm. uh, or to look online, I've discovered <laughs> not that YouTube hasn't been there this whole time, Toby, but I, I don't spend You're a lot of time. Discovered YouTube. I just discovered, no, um, but I, I really don't spend a lot of time watching television or watching YouTube in my everyday existence because I'd rather be out doing something adventurous. But what I've discovered is that if I give myself a 20 minute YouTube fix of adventure destinations every day, this actually helps me because even though I can't go book a ticket and go to these places, what I can do is start thinking about them right. and start vicariously living through the person that I'm watching on the YouTube channel. Right. And so... Uh, as you as you know from the title of one of my books, The Big Five for Life, I think having that awareness of these are the things that really bring joy to me. Mm. And these are the ways I love to spend my minutes. And then during this situation, being creative about how you connect to those things is one of right. the great things that I've learned so far. So, so to put it in a nutshell, going back to Big Five for Life, one, one of your Big Five is, is adventure travel. As you can't do it right now, you're looking for it at a, at a micro Uh, uh, spam that you have around you instead of saying the whole world is against me I'm 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 sad from today on because I can't travel right that yeah. that's yeah when yeah. when many people right now are, are suffering because they don't know what's coming which we never did we never did know what's coming this is why this this looking where you are is even more important have you had the situation that you thought to yourself wow It's so close to my home. I haven't even recognized that it's there because that's something I figure it's one positive spot of all this pandemic thing. We do things in our family we haven't done and we like them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, so I don't want to minimize the impacts of what's going on on someone's life. There are people in ICU units that are hanging on for their life breathing. There are people who have lost their jobs and are thinking to themselves, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. And so I don't want to minimize what's going on. But what I've learned in my life when I've been in those situations of, I don't know how to pay my rent. I've been in those situations where I did not have enough money to pay my rent. And you're right that sitting there and just letting it crush you doesn't, it doesn't do it. It doesn't accomplish anything. So I'm not minimizing it. But what I'm saying is if you can allow yourself to do the little things to help you get beyond that, ask for help. That's one of the most important things we can do in any aspect of life. Right. But if you're struggling, first of all, give yourself a break. As you mentioned, this is an unprecedented time. And to think to yourself, I have to have all the answers for myself, for my family, for my impossible, absolutely impossible. So cut yourself some slack and say, you know what? It's okay to say sometimes I just don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I don't know what guidance to give to my kids about school because I'm now their teacher as well as their parent and they're doing math that I really don't remember from when they was in sixth grade. All right. So give yourself some slack and then asking for help. Um, being willing to reach out to people that are your friends in your network at times that are down and just say like, I'm struggling with this. Do you guys got any advice? Who, um, who do you have in your surrounding that you call for help? Because I can imagine that so many people... Uh, so many people are idolizing you and your work, but I, I, I'm also sure as I met you as completely normal and, and down to earth, that there must be people in your surrounding where you can say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not feeling well. 
Yeah, I, I have a number of very close friends that I've had for years. Um, a bunch of them are buddies that I go on adventure travel trips with or outdoor trips. And yeah, I can pick up the phone and just be like, all right, this thing is crushing me today. <laughs> like I, I, you know, and, and just talk it out. And sometimes it's interesting, just that act of talking it out with someone lifts the weight off our shoulders. Um, I, and another thing that I, I very much subscribe to is doing my very best to be in a state of appreciation for where I'm at and how difficult it is for others. So no matter how bad I've had it in my life, especially this comes from traveling the world, you realize there's always somebody who's got it a whole lot worse. Mm. Um, I remember being in Vietnam and, and backpacking through there and seeing these men that were parts of bands or other things, just trying to raise money for their families. And they had no arms, no legs because of the landmine situation in Vietnam. And I'll never forget that, you know, in the worst of my moments, thank goodness, I, I'm lucky enough to have not had to have experienced that. So mm. I think being appreciative for what we have is another great way to keep ourselves in balance. Mm. I had a very nice situation a couple of weeks ago. Um, there was a young lady coming towards me and she said, you know, I don't have these people in my surrounding that I can ask for help because most of them, they need help. But yeah. the book of John Strilecki, that's why I'm telling you the story, where that guy is sitting in the cafe at the end of the world, there's this lady coming to the table. And now I often ask myself, what would this lady say right mm. now? So yeah, even well, having this inner dialogue, if there's nobody close to you, you can take somebody and you will have a, you will have a conversation with the dark and the light side in yeah. your mind. Do you think that's a tool that, more, that people could use? I love that tool. Yeah, I call it finding your ultimate who. And I'm honored that that person shared that story with you. And I'm honored that the book has, has helped that person. And this concept is something that I really uh, subscribe to because I've found it to be very effective in my own life. And you're right. This could be a dialogue you're having in your head with someone who is real from history. And so you might say, well, what would um, Thomas Edison do? You know, if, if you're trying to invent something, uh, it can be something some story. Hmm. It doesn't seem to matter. What's really cool about this is that you seem to be tapping into uh, what I call the cosmic algorithm, algorithm of the universe, something that underlies what we can't even see, um, where you actually are getting feedback and answers from this person, even if, right. even if it is a fictional character. It's like your mind and your unconscious connect the dots and give right. you this great I think it's an awesome technique, an absolutely yeah, and awesome you, technique. And at this moment, you do have a conversation in your head and it's not going down yeah. the drain, right? Because many people, if they have this negative surrounding or having a pandemic in the news, they have this only negative down, how do you call that? Down, down spiral, yeah. Yeah, down spiral. And then there's somebody like that lady in the cafe saying, oh, there's another, there's another side of the story, right? So, yeah. so... As the your new book is called, what what, what you have what you have learned, uh, uh, what what have you learned? What 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 is it? You know, there's so many different aspects to the things I've learned. One of the ones that I've been sharing a lot recently because it so connects with who I am in my heart is this concept that things we love come to an end. And uh, I'm a father. My daughter is now 13, and when she was very little. She used to have this routine she did at night where I would tuck her in and she would say, Daddy, can I have three hugs and seven kisses? Mm -hmm. And, you know, little kids are just so insanely cute. And if you, especially when it's your own kid, you know, and uh, you just have this connection. So every night she said, Daddy, can I have three hugs and seven kisses? Don't and tell so me she stopped doing that because my daughter will do that until, until she's 18. <laughs> that is the great wish we have is that our kids will still have that connection to us. And of course they will, but it changes and you're right. That's so, so yeah, there came a day when three hugs and seven kisses stopped being the way that our nights ended. And of course I still, to this day, I tell her, I love you. And I tell her, I'll see you tomorrow morning. And we still have a connection, but that specific event ended. Mm. And so being aware I get goosebumps only because because my daughter is five and of course oh. I, want, i don't want it to i don't want it to end hang on to it as long as you can so <laughs> yeah. yeah there will come a day when it will end. And, and all of these things you know that's one of the wonderful things about growing through life is that we progress and our kid we watch our kids grow and so there i'll, I'll tell you another one there will come a day when you don't get to pick up your kid anymore what you won't 
You will not hold her and you will not have her tuck her head against your shoulder. Not happening in our family. <laughs> then you better start weightlifting because there's going to come a time when she's like full grown. No, don't even say it. Don't, it. Don't, tell me, don't tell me that. But, and, and this is so great that we're able to laugh about these things uh, because this is the reality that we sometimes forget. We're so engaged in our everyday moments that we forget to step back a little bit and realize. And that was my big, this is what I've learned with that particular item. It's that things we love come to an end. And so what's the takeaway from that? Well, the takeaway is that when you've got seven people texting you at the end of the night about a podcast you're going to do tomorrow or about something else, and your little child says, daddy, will you tuck me in? Mm. That the best thing we can do is to completely mentally focus on that moment and be a hundred percent there for the reading of the storybook, for the tucking in, for the kiss on the cheek, for the seven hugs, or whatever it is that is your routine, but allow yourself to be 100% present in those moments. I and think that's, really, that's, that's one, one of the little positive things that people spend more time with the families during these turbulent times, right? Yeah, yeah. well, and I think that the, the, what we get from that, Toby, is that when the day comes that you don't do that anymore, it's okay because you know that when the day was there that you did do it, you were a hundred percent there. Cause I think what we regret when things go away is not that they're gone. We in part regret the fact that we didn't really do them when they were there. How did you handle the moment when that ended that tugging in seven kisses, three hugs? The crazy thing is that it doesn't, it's not like there's a dramatic, you've got 10 left. You've got five left. You've got, it's not like that. Life doesn't work. It's not like the professional athlete retiring where you get the stadium tour for an entire year. It's just like one day I can't, and I can't even remember why it ended. That's what's so crazy. Like, I don't know if she was sick for a couple of days and then she sort of, or I don't know if she just grew out of it. I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, but then you, there, there was a moment where you realized our ritual yeah. is not there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, just appreciating these moments when you have them and morphing with them as they change is one of the biggest things that I've learned. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you another one. I have uh, some things that I was thinking about today ahead of our call. Like, oh, what would be particularly interesting for your audience? Um, and there was regarding challenges, because we were just talking about the situation that's going on in the world. I think one of the best things we can do when faced with a challenge, and I know that everybody listening has probably faced some, I know you have faced many in your life and risen above them. I have faced many. Especially in my this life. year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, is to say what you were referencing. So what good is coming out of this challenge? And, you know, you're talking about with your family. So what new traditions are you starting? What new behaviors are you beginning with your family that never would have happened had this not come about, you know? And so I think allowing ourselves to step back and ask, what have I learned from this? What good has come about from this? And then this is the other aspect to me. What new thing am I going to learn? Hmm. Because we're either going to, you either walk out of a challenging situation, the same person as when you walked into it, or yeah. you walk out having learned something. Mm -hmm. And if you walk out the exact same, it's a catastrophe because you're going to make the same mistakes again the next time the challenge comes about. And I, I am happens really to most people, right? They, they experience it. They don't like it, but it will happen again and again until we learn. Totally. And I've been there. I'm, I'm the poster child for that in many different pieces of my earlier life. The mis it's, making a mistake is not a problem. Dealing with adversity is not the problem. The problem is making the same mistake again and again and again. Mm. We're not learning something from the challenge. And so I, what, I, what I've learned and what I would suggest is a great opportunity is to ask ourselves, what's the takeaway from this? And how do I adjust and, and move better in my life going forward? How do I do that best? Do I journal it? Do I talk to other people about it? Because I think in my experience, sometimes it needs something to put it into a like kind, of, kind of ritual. So I have it then, you know, ah, okay, now I got it. Because we yeah. think it so often, but then we come back to exactly the same moment and we do exactly the same mistake again. Perfect question, right? If we allow ourselves to write ourselves a personal version of what I've learned, mm. right? I didn't even think of this until you asked that question, but that is the essence of the whole purpose of this book. Mm. Yes, it's to write down the things that we've learned and share them with others, but it's also to write them down for ourselves. Mm that we don't make the same mistakes again and that we can draw, we can draw on that for strength. 
you know, when you've learned something and you've progressed, but you forget it, you sort of lose that strength. But when you can go back to it, so grab a journal, write it down, do videos for yourself, whatever is your thing, whatever works for your personality, I think is the way to, to do it, to answer your question. And everybody's answer is probably going to be a little different based on their personality. But yeah, and absolutely. share it, share it to uh, with others, right? With people who think like you and, and have a bonfire and let's just share what we have learned. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that there's something about absorbing knowledge for ourselves. And then when you share it with someone else, it's a whole new level of absorption. Mm -hmm. You know, they say that when you want to really want to learn something, teach it. Mm -hmm. And so without making it like a dramatic class situation, but take the time to share what you've learned with someone else. And it, it, it absorbs on a whole new cellular level. What I love about your new book, it's, it's a conscious look instead of a passing by. You know, I think people very often looking back, I, I, I remember this as you like YouTube now, there's an there interview with Whoopi Goldberg who has gone through shit in her life. Yeah. And she's just reflect, she just said, what I have learned is, and then there's this monologue where you can see that as, at this moment, while she says it, she's healing. Yeah. And giving it to others even. Other yeah. people don't have to do the same mistakes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's uh think of all the different aspects, whether it's sports or adventure travel or doing podcasting. When you learn something from someone else's mistake, it basically helps you to not have to do the same mistake to then learn from it. I mean, it is the greatest gift ever when you share with someone about your trials, not to make a life of not doing nothing but sharing your trials and tribulations. That would just make you an energy suck as you talk about in your book. But to, to learn from that moment and be willing to share, this is where I screwed up and here's what I took the takeaway is and here's how you can avoid screwing up. That's good stuff. Does it need a certain age to look back or wouldn't that be even great for schools? I mean, you can do this. You, the question of your book, you can ask a, a five-year-old, what have you learned this summer? What, yeah. what have you learned during our last week of school? I think we don't do that often enough. Yeah, and I think the context is important because so many times the idea of learning becomes a job. You know, and that's, I remember being a kid in school and having, that'd be, that was right about the point where, where my wall yeah. started to go up, you know. It has to have the right context, yeah. Yeah, but, but to have a conversation, just to weave it into the, I don't know, what was the best thing that happened from this as it relates to you, you know, so it's sort of like how you frame it, how you structure it, how you discuss it is going to have an impact on the way in which it's received. Mm. But yeah, absolutely. I think that helping each other think through these things is really powerful. And Your question made me think of something else, which is uh, more on the fun side in terms of how we deal with this. But this has been such a great technique for me. So it's, uh, I call it have your laugh list ready. <laughs> and so this is finding three things that every time you think about it, it makes you laugh. Like it doesn't matter what is going on when you think, and it could be something from your interactions with a friend. It could be a line from a movie. It can be anything, but have your laugh list ready. And now with technology is even better. Because you could have like a clip on your phone and it can be an audio clip. It can be a video clip, whatever, but just something that, man, when you're having a tough day, you watch that and it totally cracks you up and ships your yeah. state. We have this, we have this clip that I, I, it's just a, it's a movie. It's about a, it's a Swiss guy pretending to, it's a, it's a Japanese guy living in Switzerland, singing a, a, a song about chicken. And we watch this with our children And we just, it's just a ritual and we laugh. You cannot not laugh. It's impossible. Right. So yeah. there's, one of mine is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Dodgeball. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so there, there's a scene in there where the character is trying to teach these guys how to, and the whole movie is a comedy, of course, but there's a scene where he's trying to teach them to catch the dodgeballs. And he throws a wrench at this guy and just absolutely clocks him with his wrench. And he, he says in this gravelly voice, If you can catch wrenches, you can catch anything, right? You know, I don't know why, but like every time I see that, I just bust a gut laughing. It's, it's great acting. It's great. So that's the whole point. Like that might not make anybody else laugh. So you got to find the thing that makes you laugh. I think it's even more important right now because I see that many people are feeling bad laughing because, because there's so much going on in the world. But if we stop laughing, if we stop doing that, I mean, what is it for then, right? I mean, well, laughs, there's been many scientific studies that show that laughter is a dramatic booster of your immune system. 
And so one of the reasons to laugh is to, in part, keep ourselves healthy. Mm. When you look at the time before Corona happened, when we had uh, dinner, for example, in Frankfurt, ha have you learned something at this time that, that you would do different now by knowing that, that there's something coming, the winter is coming? Because the, the, pretty much. Awesome question. Yeah, if I'd have known COVID was coming, would I have done something different? Because you know, as we talked in our previous podcast, so many dreams ca became true in your life. So many, even with hard work, but you, you know what yeah. I mean? Is there something you would have done different? Yeah, so I've, I've really, since I got to my early 30s in life, I've really tried to live my life on point with my purpose and with my personal big five for life. And to make every day as special as possible in alignment with that. As a matter of fact, one tradition we have is uh, to ask ourselves as a family, what would make this year the best year ever? Hmm. And to, for each of us individually to think through that, and then we talk about it as a family. And uh, this has been a tough year because the things that we had on our list were impossible. To, they're, they're almost all about travel or experiences. And so all of that has been cut off. Plus book shows, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that I... I don't think there is anything. I don't think I have any regrets that I would have wished that I've done. Now, that said, I can tell you that I've been very active in putting together my list of as soon as Corona is over. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what the first six months are going to look like, you know, and uh, I can guarantee that it's going to be on a plane going to some destination. And so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's caused me to be especially appreciative of small things. You know, you're talking, we got to hang out at a restaurant eat some great food. We had an awesome dialogue. I got to know you so much better as a human being because I'd seen you before. I'd seen videos and we had had some discussions in the podcast, but I love getting to know people like at the right. real human level. Right. Now, how effortless it was that night for us to sit down and talk and laugh and have food. I can't even do that now. Like I can't even sit across the table from someone at a restaurant mm -hmm. right now. So it makes me incredibly appreciative of the little things. So maybe that's another good takeaway. <coughs> How do you handle that? Like, for example, we plan together with Laura Zyla to have an event. Remember, we, we wanted to yeah. do our little event, Laura, you, I. We had a date and that crushed. Yeah. How do you handle your emotions for things that you would love to do, but you're not, you can't. I mean, traveling is one thing. That's, that's, that's pleasure. You know, you go to the beach. Or, how do you handle it at this moment not to get frustrated? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So, right, our time together, we had planned out this, what was going to be a great event. The three of us on stage. Yeah, would have been next month. Yeah. Yeah, it was supposed to be so much fun interacting with the audience. And I think what I love about spending time with the two of you is that all three of us are very passionate about helping make a difference in the lives of other people. And our styles are all very unique. And I think that's one of the big takeaways in life is if you're going to um, get advice or coaching, whether it's sports or self-development or anything, mm. part of it is finding out which type of coach works for your personality, right? right. And everybody's different in that regard. So I think one of the things I was most looking forward to is that each of us with our own respective styles and perception on things, we're going to be able to, be, to offer the audience something really unique and special. And so that bummed me out when we couldn't do that because of a chance to really make a positive difference. Mm -hmm. Another aspect is, yeah. So I launched the book and I can't go do book signings. I can't interact with fans. I can't do events where I get to sit on a, a stage or with an audience and have fun. And I, I don't know how many books I'm going to write in my life, but that's one of the things I live for is the chance to interact with fans and have that kind of fun. So total bummer. Mm. But, you know, it's me sitting in the corner grumbling about it is not going to change at all. So all I could do is to reach, I reached out to you. I reached out to Laura. I'm going to be on her podcast next month and to say, all right, so if we can't have fun with the audience personally, Right. Let's do our best to have some fun virtually. And then when things change, we'll do it again. You know, <laughs> Our schedules will be very, very full when, when things change. <laughs> what, what, one question I wrote down before is, what would the lady at the cafe at the end of the world say about the whole thing we are experiencing right now? Not John Strzelecki, but that, that virtual woman that pretty much looks through the curtain of dust that we don't see. Yeah. What would she say? So Casey is the character that you're referring yeah, I'm to. Sorry, I forgot the name. Yeah, Casey. In, yeah. in the cafe. And yeah. Casey is this rock of wisdom. You're 100% right. Um, it's, 
And I'll tell you something funny and I'll answer your question, but I'll tell you something funny before that, that, uh, so I've written three books from the cafe and there's a fourth one that I'm working on now. And Casey, I, I knew it. I, I just wanted to ask. So what's the next book? <laughs> I knew yeah, it. Cafe book. Um, and throughout it all, Casey is this rock of wisdom. And there are times when I'm writing and, and, you know, preparing the story and something comes through me in the voice of Casey. And I kid you not, Toby, I step back from my chair and I think to myself, I, I definitely didn't say that. I definitely didn't think that like that is coming from, it is coming from the essence and the energy of Casey, right? It is something so real, so special. So what would Casey say in the midst of these times? I think, let me think about it for a second so I can tap into that energy. I think that Casey, I smile when I get into that space. Casey would say, it's going to be okay. Mm. It's going to be okay. This is going to pass. Mm. It's going to be okay. So take care of yourself. Mm. Take care of the people that you love. Spend time focusing on the, the energy that you want to be tapped into, whether it's reading a book or listening to music or just curled up with a coffee or a tea or something that makes you happy and just sit in the positive space because it's going to be okay. I yeah. think that's what you can say. Wow. And sometimes it's, it's exactly that, knowing that it's going to be okay how, how, whatever happens, right? Oh, you know what else she would say? This just, wow, this is awesome. Because this is exactly what we were talking about earlier, of tapping into the energy mm. of something, even if it's real or fictional or not. So I'm doing it now real time because you asked such a great question. Mm. And the other thing she would say is, we'll be open when you need us. Mm. Yeah, the cafe will be open. Yeah. For people who want to go, right? And yeah. that's, that's one thing I, I discover a lot right now, that there are many people who are going to the side where they are... Um, They're not even sad. They're they're so frustrated that they are that their their frustration must go in alcohol and whatever it is, some drugs, and yeah. others are becoming lighter and lighter and lightweight, even in in, in 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 these in these crazy times. When when I read the the first of your books, and and that is so interesting, what you just said that you can tap in her energy even if she is a a, a what's the English word virtual character. I mean, she she's not real but she is real the energy yeah. is real um yeah i just think that's amazing that you can talk in her energy so i'll tell you i'll tell you and actually really i don't think we talked about this on uh, the last time we did your podcast did we talk about mama gombe from safari des Lebens? no this is a pretty wicked cool example of that so when i finished the cafe on the edge of the world and that book had come out and it was doing well it was on bestseller lists and my agent said what are you going to write next And I didn't know, I mean, I, I didn't even have plans to be an author. So let alone writing one book, let alone two. But so she was like, what are you going to write next? And, and so I had this idea come to me, um, which was this, this character of Mama Gombe set in Africa, this very old, very wise African woman. And as you know, from our, our discussions, I've traveled to Africa. It's a very big part of who I am. And so this, the ending to the book came to me and it's a very emotional ending and I won't spoil it for readers. Um, but the ending came to me. And so I knew the whole time that I was writing what the ending was going to be. And Toby, when I was writing this, I had 10 days of the house just to myself. Uh, I was doing nothing but writing and it was flowing through me so fast that I could not, I could not type fast enough to keep up with the dialogue of what Mama Gombe was speaking to me in my head, this very wise, very old African woman. And so I'm writing up to the part that is very, very emotional. It's one in the morning. There's nobody home but me. The only light on is my little desk lamp in my computer. And I'm typing up to this part. And it was so real for me that I was streaming tears. Um, and I actually yelled out at this moment. I yelled out, no. And I was bawling like a baby. And the only way that I can explain that is because at that moment, I was in Africa. I was there with her. I was physically, emotionally, mentally in the exact same space with this other entity. And to this day, when I need an answer and I ask her a question in my head, I get an instant response. Wow. Yeah. It, that, I mean, that's, that's something you're connecting to the source, I would say, where she is part of. I yeah. just interviewed a, a very biologically old uh, guy, 87, and he says, 
he is very interesting marketing. He says, I don't want any introduction. Nobody has to listen to this podcast because I'm 87. I don't need any, I don't need to prove anything. And he said, I can just connect to the source and I can give you answers or not. And I think when I think, when I think about my life and your, this situation with, with that, with that African woman is that you just connect to the field and yeah. it writes, right? It's not you writing. You're just the 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 yeah. You challenge uh, channeling would be the word. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say that very often. I'm the conduit uh, between the story and the reader. And I, one of the great gifts, has been being able to be the conduit, uh, the shepherd of the story, if you will. Some people uh, would say we are crazy now saying that, right? Well, the cafe on the edge of the world came through me in 21 days. Safari so Desleben been in 10 days. You know, I don't think I could have consciously sat down and <laughs> crafted all that out. It really is sort of flowing through me. Do you have um, to do something to have this energy or come into that field? Or you, it just comes or doesn't come? Well, it's, I can tap into it pretty effortlessly. But I, for me, and I, everybody's wired differently. For me, I need to be in a quiet space. Um, noise is one of my great distractors. Um, you know, I can't have the TV on. I can't have someone talking to me. I can't even hear someone in the other room. I just need complete quiet to tap into that energy. And does it, it, is it, does it depend to a certain location or do you, when you yeah. write, can you do it at your home or do you have to go somewhere? No, I can do it at my home. I can do it. There's a park that I often go to and I write in the park and uh, that's out in nature. So that's got a certain feel to it, but it doesn't matter if I can tap into the energy of it then it flows fast and furious. And to be honest with you, I sort of lose connection with the outside world unless there is a lot of distracting noise, but I sort of enter this, this zone. And uh, I think you alluded to something, which is now one of my great fascinations in a place where I'm studying a lot, which is, and I, I think I might've referred to it earlier in, in our discussion, but it's the, the cosmic algorithm of the universe. And what I mean by that is I've noticed that there are these underlying rules of the algorithm and energies of the algorithm. And at a basic level, I think we're, when we're born, we have a lot of this and we have the ability to tap into a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, as we grow, depending on where we grow up and the support structure we have, it's sort of either beaten out of us or it is just told that it's not real or, but I really think it is real. And I think that this is one of the great opportunities for personal growth is learning to trust the deep intuitive connection to this, because I think the answers we seek are really sitting there. Right. And writing is a vehicle that I do that by. Uh, but I think every major decision you have in life that you can enter a space. Matter of fact, we've, I know we've talked about this or you referred to it, the museum concept. Mm -hmm. If you can put yourself in a quiet environment and enter your own personal museum, right. I think you can tap into that algorithm of the universe in a way yeah. that is very, what to do elsewhere and interestingly enough young children and old and wise people have that connection what once they because they're yeah. both close to the source yeah right one yeah. coming one leaving i mean that that energy is something where many young people of course don't dig in because they want to have their car and the job and all that and then there comes this moment of either just being in the moment because you're a child or reflecting and asking the question what i've learned Yeah. And I think that uh, if we allow ourselves to, then maybe that's one of the things that this situation going on in the world presents a great opportunity because there are less distractions if we allow them to be. Now, granted, we could get on and watch a number of 50,000 programs on Netflix or YouTube or Amazon Prime or whatever. So there's plenty of distractions if we want there to be. But there's also the opportunity for a little more quiet. I think just think of commuting alone. I don't, I don't personally commute, but If you had a commute that took you 35 minutes each way, you now have an hour and 10 minutes every day that you didn't have before. And right. the question is, in what way are you going to leverage this opportunity? And so to me, giving yourself, yourself that time to maybe journal these things that I've learned, giving yourself that time to sit in a quiet space and reflect on what do you want to connect with the algorithm of the universe on? Maybe it's that question, why am I here? So that when this is receded, Or even before that, if you answer that question, why am I here? And maybe it's to be a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. Now you tap into all the not, not distractions, but all the information. Now you can start watching the YouTube videos about being a pastry chef. Right. So reading, about it, connecting with sources. But this could be maybe the, the opportunity of a generation. 
to get clear and, on and it. And it's especially an opportunity now where we can ask, are we at the right time at the with the right people? And am I doing the right thing? Because now we are forced to look. But yeah. in addition, and that's a question I have to you, there is this force that is with all the, 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 the news that we are bombarded with, before Corona, I said, okay, I don't, I don't want to watch any news. It, it just distracts me. I don't need to know if in Korea this and this happens. Now I'm, I'm like, okay, but if I don't know what's going on, I don't even know if I can host this event next week. And when, then when I watch the news, I'm like, oh my God, I see, I, I look into a, into a world that I try to avoid. How do you handle that? Do you watch news? Then if, how? That's something that interests me. Yeah, it's, again, another great question because I am, just like you described, prior to this situation, I never watched the news. I never looked up CNN on the news, on the web, nothing. I had zero connection to sort of what mainstream news was. Hmm. And then over the last, since March or since January, I guess, when things started to happen, I found myself every day going on and looking for the update. And I think part of it is, as you said, we're related to like, okay, if your business has something to do with this, how does that relate? And part of it is just our like personal safety is potentially at stake. And more important, even so than that, if you have a family is like, okay, I am the, I'm the guardian of my family and their safety may be at stake. So Silver I have back. <laughs> yeah. And so, but I will tell you that I've noticed this in myself also that the way I feel, cause it sucks you in. Right. <laughs> it's, and that's the danger. You don't stop with yeah. that one update. Then it's that no. and that and that. Right. And, and it is designed to suck. So I talk about the algorithm, the algorithm of the universe. So let me tell you, there is an algorithm of social media, an algorithm of the news media, which is designed to suck you in because you click on one story about COVID cases in Korea right now. I guarantee you that the next three things that they're going to feed you is, you know, COVID cases in Korea, Japan, and China, because they think you're looking for that region. So it is no doubt challenging, but I have found that the answer is you just got to turn it off. Yeah. And what makes it easy to turn off is the 20 minute YouTube about the thing that you're interested in, because now you have something to weigh the scales on. How did I feel when I watched about, you know, hiking volcanoes in El Salvador versus how I felt about what the nudist story was about somebody upset about something. So making sure that you allow yourself to have balance and then choose the one that makes you happier has been absolutely essential for me because I found myself getting sucked into the same hole you're talking about. So is it now with you like a 10-90 ratio? I mean, you, you, you still get information, but then you consciously decide, no, I now watch the volcano and... Yeah, I, I literally... <laughs> I, I look at two things. I look at the world counts and the country counts to see what the cases are per country. Mm -hmm. And I do a quick scan of the news events and then I leave and that's it. Because especially, especially the U.S., I, 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 you know, I love the U.S., but when I was there for the first time, um, when I was 16, the news are very different than here. There's always this local alert or there's a bee storm, there's this, there's this, there's a shooting here. Uh, um, we, we didn't have that so much in that time. And I, mean, I think many people are wired always to look at what's happening, negative. And, and then there's this psychological concept, which uh, the, Eng the German word is Rauschen. It, it kind of like, it goes through you and you add that there's, there's this moment where you don't realize it anymore, but you become a part of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's this amazing book that was written probably two decades ago called The Hidden Messages in Water. It was written by a Japanese scientist, and he did all of these studies to show what is the impact on water of things like words, music, imagery. And I remember I got it at this little tiny bookstore, and it used to be run. She has passed away since, since then, but it was run by this woman. She was so intuitive, so tapped into the source, the algorithm. Toby, you'd walk in and she'd like give you kind of one of these looks, like a quick look over and she'd be like, come here. <laughs> and she would just, she would give you the perfect book for you, you know, and you're just like, whoa, okay. And so one day I walked in and she gave me this book, The Hidden Messages in Water. And she said, you're going to love this book. So, okay. So I get home and I start reading and it's talking about how words have this impact on the water structure. It looks like you crystal know. that changed, sorry. That changed. Yes, exactly. And so I'm reading and I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like I get it, but I don't really get it, you know? And then Finally, I get to like page 70 of the book and it says, 
And oh, by the way, the human body is composed of, I don't remember the number. It's like 65% water, 80% water. Isn't, it, isn't his name Ki Kimoto or something? Ki Ki so it's a Japanese guy. I remember that, a Japanese scientist. So the huge takeaway for me as it relates to your question is that every single second, your environment and what you allow into your environment, whether it's coming through the screen or what's on the walls around you or the people that are talking to you, is having a radically significant impact on you on a cellular level and how you feel and the thoughts that come from that. So if I'm reading everything that is going to be making me afraid, my thoughts are nothing but fear. Mm. And so this, she was totally right. This book changed my life because it makes me very aware about how my surrounding environment in whatever form is making me feel. The good news is that if it's making you feel like crap, you can change your environment. You can right. change what's on the screen. You can right. watch the YouTube video about hiking volcanoes instead of right. the one about, you know, getting shot. Yeah. The danger of that all is that we can't see it. It's like magnetism. It's like the, the law of attraction. It's there, but you can't see it. The right. I always give this example when you go to a, to a music store and you have this thing where it can make a certain tone with and all the mm -hmm. instruments tap into that frequency. Yeah. You can't see it, but it's still there. And it is in both sides, light and dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, so and think about a movie, a great movie. They build suspense, not just through the visual imagery, but it is so much the music that underlies the, underlies the moment in the movie. Uh, watch some of the Marvel movies, especially like Endgame. Oh, my gosh. The spectacular use of music to drive emotion. Hmm. Uh, you raised a good point, which is sometimes you're being impacted by these things and you don't even know they're there. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what you can monitor is how you feel. How you feel, yeah. If you know that you have the ability to master your emotional state and you feel like something is dramatically impacting you, that is what enables you to open up your field of vision and say, well, what is it? You know, is, is it something in my space? Is it something I can't even tell? Maybe I need to move myself to a different location so I actually feel better. Go to the park, go for a walk in the woods, go to or the beach. Or sell the house you live in and go somewhere else, right? Sometimes it needs radical decisions. <laughs> you know, again, like I love the fact that you're asking and thinking these thoughts. So one of the things that struck me, I had a friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer and she struggled and struggled and fought with this for so long. And when she finally was quote unquote recovered, she went back to the same exact house And four years later, she was diagnosed again, and she didn't make it the second time. And I could not help but wonder, was there not something there that was part of the reason that she was um, suffering so much? And I have told my family, like, if I ever get seriously sick, like, I want you guys to take a look at my environment and move me somewhere else, you know, because maybe that's part of it. I mean, that's why many people's Uh, many people, especially young people, that want to go to to Hawaii or Bali or, or in Europe, there's this this uh, island. Either it's Fortaventura or Ibiza. You know, it's these it's it, it's places that have a, a certain mystical energy that people can't explain, but they are going. But at this moment where you are sick, at this moment where something happens, it's that constant that that conscious step towards that instead of going down again, right? And so if we can't physically get on the plane and go to Bali or these other places right now, and I know this may sound silly, but I, I really don't think it is silly. I think this is part of that algorithm of the universe that everything is operating at a vibrational frequency, which we are interacting with. And so if I can't go to Bali, I can definitely get a poster of Bali and I can right. put that up on my wall. Um, I'm not in my office right now. because Sounds not. goofy, but it's, it helps. I know. But, and so here's an example of that, that, Uh, so my family and I, as you know, like we travel a lot. And so what happens is you take pictures on your phone and then they have energy when you take them, but then they lose the energy because they're sitting on your phone and nobody ever looks at them again. And so I went through all these pictures and I had 400 of them printed out mm -hmm. and I made it like one of those restaurants, which is the kind of restaurant that I love where you go and there's pictures all over the walls of the restaurant. I literally all over my office is nothing but these pictures. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Toby, I think that is part of what creates that energy in my space. Is M just, Museum days to talk yeah. like John Strzelecki, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, right? I mean, if you're going to surround yourself with anything, why not make it something positive? What's your favorite music? As we talked about music before, what do you love to listen to? 
Okay. Um, so <laughs> now my, it comes. <laughs> here it comes. My guilty pleasure. I just listened to it again yesterday. Is the entire soundtrack from Pitch Perfect. Really. I, I don't know what it is about that movie. I, I, I don't watch a lot of movies. Movie, yeah. really but there's something about that movie that just makes me smile. It makes me laugh. I mean, there's a lot of aspects of comedy in the movie, but there's something about the music in there that just makes me feel good. And so it's, it's on my phone. And whenever I'm having like, I don't know, any sort of down or whenever I just want to feel a pick me up, I literally listen if, to if that. If John Strzelecki doesn't watch Volcanoes in Belize, what, what kind, if you watch a movie, what, what kind of movies do you watch? Do you have something where we, where, it's probably not horror, but even if it is, it would be admitting it. What, what, what do you watch? Yeah, so I can't do anything. So I'm very uh, empathic in the way that I'm wired. I feel things on a deep level, which I think is what enables me to write the things that I write because I've always felt if, if I feel something when I'm writing it, then the reader will feel something as well. And that means that I can't watch anything that involves like people experiencing pain because it stays with me on such a deep level. I just can't do it. Got it. Uh, and so what I watch is, but I love like Marvel movies because I love the little guy fighting for the other little guys and winning. So that's and, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think part of what I love about those movies is the music too, because I think the music and it's great storytelling. And it's and not real fun. pain, you know, it's, it's, it's artists who are playing it. <laughs> yeah. So when I look at like the original X-Men movies, 15, 20 years ago, and I compare those to Marvel, the difference is the X-Men movies were great, but they were nothing but adrenaline mm -hmm. and drama. Marvel, they've figured out the formula where every 5.6 minutes or whatever it is, you're laughing. There's something in there that is designed to make you laugh. Mm -hmm. And so I think they've got that right blend of action. The hero wins and you laugh a little bit along the way. And, and that works for me. Sometimes my team asks me, like, do you have a do you have this one word after a podcast interview? And I think talking talking now with you. Uh, it, what we talked about is consciousness uh, like what you have learned is being conscious i mean I, i didn't say that you haven't learned it before but in an ens in an essence right yeah is looking well, at what is i will say with 100 percent uh humbleness mm -hmm. that this idea of being aware and being conscious of my moods my environments the rest of that it's something i had no understanding of for the first at least 25 years of my life and probably a lot more than that if I thought through it. Why? I just didn't know. I didn't know this. I know it sounds like I'm an idiot, but I didn't realize that the thoughts in my head were impacted by my environment. And I didn't realize that I could change the thoughts that I was having. One of the most profound things that I've added to my life is the use of a mantra. And this is where if I'm having thoughts that are unsupportive and I am aware, I have the conscious awareness, as you said, that this is not getting me where I want to go, then I instantly drop into my mantra. And my mantra are five things that this is the life that I want my life to be living. And they're stated as if they were already so. This single modification, Toby, if I'd have learned this when I was five or six or even 18, would have drastically accelerated me in a positive direction in my life. But I just didn't know. What's the mantra? So I, it's, I will tell you, so I can give you an example of a mantra item. I don't actually personally share any of my five. It's okay, one of the only that's things fine. in my entire yeah. existence I'll share. But right. um, an example would simply be if you were a person who had never traveled mm -hmm. and you always dreamed of traveling, mm -hmm. one of your mantra items would be, uh, I am a world traveler. Mm. I travel and see the world, any sort of variation on that. But the, the key thing it. is that it's not, I hope I will travel the world or I wish to travel right. the world. I'm a world I'm traveler. Yeah. Yeah. Say it as if it actually exists. Right. And what is fascinating about that is if you allow yourself to get into that space, as we were talking about energetically, you connect to the field again, right? Yeah. You enter the field and the opportunities that come your way are different because now you actually are a traveler. And so the conversations with a random stranger are going to be about travel in ways. And, and I know this sounds probably a little bizarre, but it's actually like sending out a homing beacon to the universe that says, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. This is the life I live. Mm -hmm. And therefore connect to me with the people that can best support that, or I can best support in that way. Got it. 
it was a very, very inspirational talk. Again, we're already talking for an hour. Again, unbelievable. I think this is, we, we're, we're going to do like a series, right? Every, every book, we should do it in between books, which is difficult because you write very fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, so you're right. I mean, the, I, I can't believe an hour has gone by. Uh, and if there are things that your audience is saying, wow, I would love to hear John and Toby talk about confidence or love to talk about um, taking a dream and making it real, whatever these things are, like, I would love to get on this and do it again, because we could talk. We could do an Insta Live if you want. We could do an Insta Live together where they could ask some questions, if that would yeah. be interesting. We could do it in English even. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That sounds very, very good. So in German, again, if you don't, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you, um, I will say that in German for the German speaking audience. So auf Deutsch heißt das Buch von John Strilecki, gibt es gerade überall, entweder bei Amazon oder in deinem lokalen Buchhandel, was ich gelernt habe. Kannst du dir also bestellen? I just said, buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> Which doesn't, make, which doesn't make any difference because you sell a book every 10 seconds. <laughs> well, the, the hope is that every book out there has the chance to make a positive difference in the life of the person who's reading it. And, I, know. Uh, I was just kidding. <laughs> and I, know. I know. And you know what I love also? It's, it's, you have this lean marketing style of the book. It's this yellow, your name, and then the title. And the title is so simple, so easy that people grab it and say, what, what's that? Right. So uh, thank you for all your knowledge, your wisdom and your insight. And uh, if there's anything we can do here for you on the German in the German speaking part of the world, um, let us know. And um, yeah, well, thank I, you. I know that you're out there. I know that you're out there making a positive difference in the lives of people every day. I know that in reading your book. Uh, so for those of you who have it, I'm sure everybody who's listening to your podcast has read it. <laughs> They probably have to, hopefully read it. Yes. <laughs> But like I said, I think that the chance for people to hear different stories and you're one of the things I love about you as a human being is a willingness to throw yourself out there and say, this is what I didn't know. This is where it was painful for me. This is where I struggled. And you do it with humor. I mean, I laughed my way through the first chapter so many times. Uh, and I really appreciate all the ways in which you throw yourself out there to make a positive difference in the world. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, John. And thank you for our friendship. And next time uh, we meet, we definitely have to have dinner again. And uh, then there's this kayaking tour we wanted to do with Laura. And there we should definitely bring a camera uh, a man or camera woman because they will see me falling and you two laughing. So that's also on the, on the horizon somewhere. Uh, Absolutely. So you got, we got to do dinner last time, which was really definitely your space, not my space. So now we're going to enter my space and we're going to go kayaking together. <laughs> All right. So let me do my, my final words in German. Ich danke euch ganz, ganz herzlich fürs Zuhören. Seid so lieb, gebt uns eine Bewertung, wenn euch das gefallen hat. Und äh, viel Spaß mit den nächsten Folgen mit Melanie und mit mir. Alles Liebe. Tschüss, der Tobi. <lacht>